Hello everyone, and welcome to episode 86 of Analyzing Evil, featuring the themes and characters of American History X. American History X is, in my opinion, one of the most important films ever made. Within this film, we find a story that perfectly portrays the sad realities of indoctrination, hate, gang life, and criminality, horrors that have affected thousands, if not millions of lives, over the course of human history. In this film, we have a family thrust into a world of debilitating hatred, hate that surrounds them on all fronts, and threatens to drown them in a cesspool of ignorance and despair. But there are many nefarious forces at play in this story, and in this video, we're not going to cover just one character, but every aspect of this film, as there's evil to be found everywhere in this story. Now without further ado, let's begin. The events of this film have their roots in something that is both a blessing and a curse, change. Though initially we're made to believe that Derek's descent into hatred and white supremacy is a result of the death of his father, in this flashback we learn that racism was already a staple in the Vineyard household. Here Derek's father lambasts Derek's teacher, Dr. Sweeney, for putting his class through a unit on black literature. Though his father seems to be an upstanding family man, his cultural ignorance is revealed to us through a line spoken by Derek's mother, where she states that they don't read Tom Clancy in school. Now there's nothing wrong with reading Tom Clancy, and we don't know for sure what this man's educational background is, but the way he reacts to the revelation of Derek's curriculum, we can't but help to picture him as an ignorant person, at least when it comes to culture and race. This ignorance is further expanded upon when we discover the real issue he has with what his son is learning, his dissatisfaction with the developing racial climate in America. He asks his son what was wrong with the old books and questions the judgment of Dr. Sweeney by positing that he's put these books into the curriculum because he somehow knows best with his two PhDs. But immediately afterward, he goes on to talk about how at his fire department, two black men received positions after scoring lower on the entry exam than two white men who had higher scores and Derek's father blames this on affirmative action. Now I'm not here to say that affirmative action is perfect, nor am I going to argue the pros and cons of it, because this is obviously an intensely controversial issue. And if it really is the case that these men got their positions because they were black, even though they were less qualified, then I don't agree with that. And the reason why will become clear as we continue with this video, but there's a lot of information left out here that could potentially alter our view of this scenario. Did these men receive the job solely because they were black, or did they perhaps receive the job because they had other qualities that were superior to the other candidates outside their test scores? Perhaps they were more personable, better communicators, had great resumes, or had any other qualifications that might have given them the edge in the interview process. But regardless of how you feel about this issue or the facts of this situation, the real core of Dennis's problem here is with the encroachment of other races into his previously white-dominated world. And this is reflected quite well in his insertion of his suspicion that there might be some kind of hidden agenda at play here. And then he makes it all the more clear how he feels about black people when he drops the N-word in reference to Sweeney's lessons. Now there's a couple things to note here that are incredibly important in understanding why Derek fell so far when his father was murdered. The first is the racism in his household, but you also have to consider his apparent adulation of his father, as Derek obviously looked up to his dad and took to heart any lessons he might have imparted upon him. And though Derek's mother mostly seems to be a force for good in the Vineyard household, she's guilty of one thing that worsens the situation considerably, apathy. As although she makes a weak attempt at challenging her husband's assertions about affirmative action, she ultimately takes a backseat and lets her husband spew his racist vitriol with near impunity, which of course allows these ideas to go virtually unchallenged in their home. Now, most people who have a good relationship with their parents would be saddened by their deaths, but the combination of Derek's adulation for his father and the racist rhetoric he impressed upon him made it so that his father being murdered by a black drug dealer stung more than it would have otherwise. Now, it's unknown how Cameron Alexander and Derek met. It might have been by Derek reaching out to Cameron after his father's death, or more likely, Cameron sought out Derek. But regardless, what broke the Vineyard family far more than the death of their patriarch was the ensnarement of a broken-hearted Derek in the tendrils of Cameron Alexander, a coupling that spelled the downfall for not only Derek and his family, but countless others in Venice Beach, and presumably all across the country, considering Cameron says at one point during the film how widespread their message has become since they started putting their material on the internet. Cameron and Derek went on to form the Disciples of Christ, their very own white supremacist gang, taking advantage of insecure, frustrated, and impressionable kids to grow their organization exponentially to the point where their gang was able to challenge and contend with the other gangs that populated the area. And from the sound of it, it seems they inspired other like-minded individuals to form their own gangs as well. As time went on, Derek became so ingrained in his new lifestyle 
that this once average looking high school student became a textbook representation of a skinhead, complete with numerous Nazi tattoos and immense amounts of anger, organizing the robbery and destruction of minority owned businesses, starting turf wars with rival gangs, and strong arming his mother's would be Jewish boyfriend out of his family's life. Derek was situated to bring his new gang to horrifying heights. That is, until the night that the gangsters he started a beef with on the basketball court earlier that day decided to pay him back by robbing him. Now what ensues after Danny alerts his brother to the attempted carjacking seems to be justified, as opening your front door to find a man holding a gun on your doorstep and then shooting him as he turns around might seem like a completely reasonable thing to do. But in reality, the appropriate response here is to keep your door shut, call the police, and pick these men out in a lineup later to minimize your risk of getting in just as much trouble with the law for killing someone who is no threat to your person before you open that door. But even if you consider what Derek did here as being justified, what wasn't justified at all is gunning down a man, Lawrence, who was running away and then unloading the rest of your gun into a car that was also trying to get away. The only reason that Derek shot at these men is hatred, plain and simple. He didn't need to kill them, but he wanted to and that becomes all the more apparent when he takes it a step further and curb stomps Lawrence. If you want to make the argument that if Derek had not shot at or killed these other men, that they might have returned to their gang to set up some retaliation, that's fine. But that notion doesn't hold much water when you consider that their gang could have easily chosen to retaliate after Derek killed these two men. So any way you slice it, this was a wholly unnecessary and vile act that didn't do anything to make the situation any better. Especially when you consider that Derek seems to have been a big source of income in the Vineyard household after their father's passing. And when Derek is sent to prison for three years, the Vineyard family loses their home and are forced to move into a cramped and run down two bedroom apartment. And Danny, who was taken under his brother's wing prior to his incarceration, was now poised to become the new shining star of the Disciples of Christ in Derek's absence. So what is the origin of all this death and misery that has been brought upon the Vineyard family and others adjacent to them? Well, racism certainly, but more importantly, hatred. When Derek is being interviewed by a news station following his father's death, he mentions that America is becoming a haven for criminals. And while that might be a bit of a stretch, he briefly touches on the heart of the problem here, that being criminality. Nobody likes criminals. Well, almost nobody. No one enjoys getting beaten, stolen from, defrauded, or killed. I think we can all agree on that. And had Derek stopped right there, he would have been right on the money. But instead he takes one huge step further and claims that social parasites were the ones who murdered his father. And by social parasites, he doesn't mean criminals, he means minorities, which he then goes on to blame for every issue plaguing America when he says that everything is race related and the people who aren't white are to blame for all of America's problems. Derek almost had it right. He almost placed his finger on the real issue, that being that his dad was killed by a criminal. But since that criminal just so happened to be black, Derek's previous experience with racism in his own household overruled his sense. If his father had been murdered by a white man, Derek would have undoubtedly been singing a different tune. What Derek and other people who fall prey to this terrible mindset fail to see is that it doesn't matter what color the criminal's skin is, they're still a criminal. You can't write off a whole race because of a few bad apples. People of color despise criminals just as much as white people do. Do you think anyone wants to walk out their door wondering if their house will be robbed while they're gone, or fear that their home or loved ones might be caught in the crossfire of a gang-related shooting? Does any mother or father want their sons to become gangsters and drug dealers? Unless they're criminals themselves, of course they don't. And as far as racism is concerned, as much as some people don't like to acknowledge it, racism isn't a one-way street. Black kids picking on white kids because they're white is just as bad as white kids doing the exact same thing. But when it comes down to it, every single one of the characters in this story are all victims of indoctrination. Racism is a terrible thing no matter how you put it. And Derek Vineyard being indoctrinated into a gang is as much of a problem as any other young white, black, Hispanic, or Asian kid being indoctrinated into gang life or other insidious organizations. But to say that anyone being raised around or by gangsters and other criminals doesn't have a much higher chance of becoming one themselves is absurd. And unfortunately, parasites like Cameron Alexander are readily available to sow their corruption, though sometimes they do thankfully earn a bit of what's coming to them, like when Cameron gets sent to the hospital after being assaulted. But even that is only adding to the problem of a continuous cycle of hatred. Derek might have claimed in his interview that the excuse of labeling a person a product of their environment holds no weight, but it does. It's not the entire problem, as everyone makes their own choices, 
But to say that a person of color being raised around or by gangsters and other criminals doesn't have a much higher chance of becoming one themselves is absurd. And the fact that Derek downplays the effect one's environment has on a person is laughable, considering that he fell to darkness because of the environment he was raised in. When a person of any race is subjected to mistreatment by another, and they're raised to view that race as inferior or nefarious, it's understandable when their knee-jerk reaction is to shift blame to the entire race. But that doesn't make it okay. When someone becomes a victim of gang violence or any other type of crime, it's understandable that they would want to do something about it, and they should. You shouldn't stand by and allow criminals to harm you, your family, or your property. But is the appropriate response to criminality to condemn entire groups of people for the actions of the few? No, of course not. It isn't the race that's the issue. It's the criminals committing crimes against others. Who sexually assaulted Derek in prison? A group of white guys? No, a group of criminals did that. Who killed Derek's father? A black man? No, a criminal did that. Hating criminals and the misery they bring upon you or others isn't wrong, but that doesn't mean that hate should be amplified tenfold until it rebounds back onto you or the people around you. All we can do is fight for justice in a world filled with many injustices. And to pile further misery on an already miserable situation only makes it worse, and the answer to whether or not all this hate and the effect it has on those who succumb to it is worth spending energy on is perfectly summed up by Dr. Sweeney when he asks Derek a simple question. Has anything he's done since subscribing to this line of thinking improved his life? No, it hasn't. And unless you're one of the lucky few who get to rise to the top of the criminal world or get away with your crimes, sooner or later, it always makes your life worse. Thankfully, Derek recognizes this and attempts to turn his life around and redeem himself. If, that is, you believe he's worthy of redemption. But that's the beauty of life. Sometimes a person taken down a dark path can find their way back to the light. And if those they wronged can offer them forgiveness, who's to say that they can't be welcomed back into the fold? Unfortunately, dark deeds reap dark rewards. And as a final blow to the Vineyard family, Danny is made to suffer the ultimate price for his brother's willingness to invite hatred into their household as a permanent guest. So in the end, what is this film trying to tell us? Well, in the words of its screenwriter, David McKenna, the point I tried to make in the script is that a person is not born a racist. It is learned through the environment and the people that surround you. The question that intrigued me is, why do people hate and how does one go about changing that? My premise was that hate starts in the family. He certainly showed us that, and this film showed us just how much of a folly hatred and racism are, no matter who's doing the hating. There are horrid environments out there populated by horrid people who twist the minds of our youth, youth who go on to repeat the cycle and usher in a new generation filled with hatred and anger at fabricated issues that only cover up the real problems facing them. Poverty and crime are far more detrimental to one's development, health, and prosperity than one set group of people are. A man or woman's worth should be judged by just that, their worth, and a criminal should be judged by their behavior, nothing else. We're all humans, and the sooner we start seeing that, the sooner we can move past some of the horrible issues that have plagued our society since time immemorial. Hate is all-consuming. Hate corrupts everything it touches. But with just a bit of kindness, the offer of a different perspective, and a little understanding, we can all make a difference. We can all fight to ensure the future is free from the hatred of the past. And if we can all someday learn to see one another for who we are, if, as Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. once said, we can all judge one another not by the color of our skin, but by the contents of our character, we might just find that we're one step closer to stamping out evil. Thank you all for tuning in to this episode of Analyzing Evil, and I hope you've enjoyed. What are your thoughts on American History X? Did I miss anything? Let me know down below and leave a suggestion for a villain you'd like to see featured while you're at it. If you like this video, hit that thumbs up button and make sure to subscribe if you haven't already. A big thank you to all of my subscribers and to my patrons, and a most vile thank you to those whose names you're seeing on screen now. Join the channel's Discord server and Reddit to interact with myself and the community, and follow me on the social media platforms listed below to keep up with the channel. And of course, don't forget to check out the new merchandise that you're seeing on screen now by clicking the link down below. As always, thanks for watching, and I'll be seeing you soon.